Tales of children living and surviving in the wild have fascinated us for centuries. From Romulus and Remus, the mythical twins raised by a she-wolf, to the legendary Tarzan of the Apes. Each of these wilderness children has reportedly learned the ways of the jungle, the language of their adopted family, and survived for years away from all human contact. But are these stories fact or fiction? Could a child really survive alone in the forest? Would animals care for rather than eat a human baby? And if left in the wilderness, can a child forget its human origins and transform into a wild beast? Experts in the field of psychology and animal behavior examine the world's most compelling cases. From the boy in Uganda who lived with monkeys, to the girl in the Ukraine raised among dogs, and the Australian woman said to run with kangaroos. Skeptics and believers alike will attempt to uncover the truth behind feral children. If a baby were left alone in the woods, how would it manage to survive? We humans come into the world completely helpless. We know little more than how to breathe and how to cry. Animals, on the other hand, stagger to their feet within minutes of birth and begin to take on the world. They instinctively know how to get nourishment from their mothers. Life is a struggle, and only the fittest survive. Human and animal offspring do have some things in common, but a human child is ill-equipped to face the world on its own. So if a child is removed from its parents and the comforts of home, could it survive? And is it possible that in the absence of its own mother, a nurturing monkey would step in? We've all heard this sort of story before. Tales of so-called feral children who live in the wild, often as part of a family of animals. But are these stories real? Would I rule it out? No, it may be possible, it may have been possible, it may have happened. My gut instinct is to say some are probably real and some are not. Although rare, tales of wild children have appeared all over the world. Oksana Malaya, known as the Ukrainian dog girl, lived for years with a pack of dogs. In South Africa, a boy named Lucas allegedly spent his childhood in the care of a troop of baboons. Amala and Kamala were a pair of Indian girls who local police found sleeping in a wolf den. These stories are intriguing and oddly compelling. But what's the truth behind feral children? The word feral has many different meanings, but here we're using it in the sense of children who either reared themselves without human companionship or more likely were reared by some form of animal. Dr. Douglas Candland has studied the phenomenon of feral children and their alleged interactions with wild animals. He's examined hundreds of reported cases and says that most rely on eyewitness accounts and have certain elements in common. We all said the child had no recognizable speech. The child did not like to eat cooked food. The child walked on all fours. So quite properly, people were saying, this is a wild child. But just how reliable are these accounts? One of the most compelling cases in modern history comes from Kampala in Uganda. Kampala is home to over a million people who, like most city dwellers, face a sometimes difficult commute to work. 
but one wrong turn on these dusty roads can lead to some of the world's thickest jungle. Two hours south of Kampala, on the edge of Africa's untamed forests, lies Bombo village. It was here, in 1991, that a remarkable story emerged. A woman walking through the African brush one day was startled by a group of verbet monkeys chattering in the trees. The monkeys were a common sight around the outskirts of the village, often stealing food and bothering the locals. But as the woman watched them, she caught a glimpse of something that terrified her. A dark form crouching in the branches. The creature that caused her to run was a human boy. Later, when the woman realized what she'd seen, she went back into the jungle and brought the child home. News of the strange boy quickly spread. The local villagers felt sorry for him, but they weren't quite sure what they were seeing. Everybody came to see the new boy, who had hair all over, and he had no toe. The toe was bitten by monkeys. Children from the village recalled that when the boy first arrived, he was as wild as an animal. He could do scratch you like uh, you are not a human being. Do you know how a cat does? He could scratch you like a cat. They decided that the boy must have been in the forest for a while. Apparently, he hated to be kept indoors, wouldn't eat cooked food, and didn't like to wear clothes. And he wouldn't or couldn't talk. But the boy did seem to be able to communicate with the vervets and even moved like a monkey. He was moving like this, just like a monkey. <laughs> Before long, locals were calling him a real-life Tarzan the fictional boy who grew up in the jungle. Wow! Wow! We are wondering, what kind, of, what kind of guy is this? It was really amazing to see such a guy making noise of, of an animal. So who was this mysterious wild child? Local authorities eventually identified him as John Sabunya, a four-year-old that had gone missing from a nearby village a year earlier. To this day, the villagers believe it was the monkeys that helped this defenseless child to survive alone in the wild. It's a romantic notion, but is this really what happened? Perhaps the only way to find out for sure is to ask John Sabunya himself what he remembers. When it comes to stories of feral children, it's often hard to separate fact from fiction. Most of the cases occur in remote areas, where the details are poorly documented. And then there's the input of the media. Stories of children raised by animals make the sensational headlines, and the details often get lost in copy that's written to satisfy an audience thrilled by news of the weird. Many such stories eventually turn out to be fabrication. A case in point is this tale of a young woman from Eucla, a tiny outpost on the coast of Western Australia. Eucla isn't the kind of place you'd expect to make headlines, but in the 1970s, a strange story began to make the rounds. A couple of hunters claimed they'd spotted a half-naked young woman running with a pack of kangaroos. She was uh, blonde, not too tall, medium size but nice developed the rumor quickly spread and curious sightseers began to flock to eucla in search of the kangaroo girl a busload of tourists did get a glimpse of her and eventually a photographer caught her on film the locals nicknamed her the nullabore nymph and the media had a field day but the story turned out to be a hoax the brainchild of four drinking buddies who thought the tiny town of Eucla and its population of 50 could use a little publicity. We had a chance to introduce our secluded place to the whole world. Then kangaroo skins. Then as the tour buses came into town, the boys would cue the kangaroo girl. 
and then Denise ran across the roads. All in all, a harmless bit of deception. Nobody was hurt, nobody died, no kangaroo got killed, so why not make a nice story? The perpetrators of the kangaroo girl hoax capitalized on the fact that people are fascinated by shocking and sensational stories. And plenty of people bought into this one. But what about other famous wild child stories? Could they be real? But among the many reported cases, there are a handful that deserve a closer look. Perhaps the most carefully documented account of a feral child came from southern France at the turn of the 19th century. Once there was a child left to himself in the woods. This is a 1970s movie trailer for Francois Truffaut's film Wild Child. It dramatized the story of Victor of Aveyron and was child. based on eyewitness Look accounts of the day. Proof of the animal in all of us. One cold morning, just a few days into the year 1800, the citizens of a southern French village woke to find that a wild-looking boy had appeared from the nearby woods. Some villagers claimed to have glimpsed him before, and local legend had it that he'd lived in the woods from an early age. That winter had been particularly bad, so perhaps the boy had been drawn to the village looking for something to eat. Eventually, he was taken in by a budding psychologist, Dr. Jean-Marc Gaspard Dittard, who gave him the name Victor. Like John Sabunia, Victor wasn't able to communicate with humans. He disliked clothes, wouldn't eat the food prepared for him, and seemed to prefer the outdoors. We know a lot about Victor because his rehabilitation was closely followed by the leading scientists of the day, who were embroiled in an age-old and fundamental debate. What does it mean to be human? Will a child raised in the wild become a man or a beast? Will a boy living with wolves become wolf-like? Or is he hardwired to be human? Are we essentially the product of nature or nurture? Dr. Adriana Benzaken, an author and Mount St. Vincent University professor, believes that the driving force behind the scientific interest in feral children centers around the old debate of nature versus nurture. Some scientists believe that to study human nature, you had to somehow peel all everything that had been added by society, by education, and get to the core, get to the natural man. How could you do that? The simplest way to do this would be to take a child, deprive it of any human contact, and see how it develops. But of course, this would be illegal, never mind unconscionable. Indeed, the very idea became known as the forbidden experiment. But then, scientists realized that there was another option cases of feral children. Children who by accident had been taken away from society and had grown in isolation from society. Some people believe that by studying such cases you could really see what was natural about human beings and what in a human being is social or is acquired. Victor of Aveyron walked out of the woods at the very height of this debate. In the case of Victor of Aveyron, we have reports of sightings of him dating from at least a year before his definitive capture. There is a, a strong possibility that he had been living that way for at least three years and perhaps longer. Here was an apparently genuine case of a child, about 12 years old, who'd been cut off from society and was living in the wild. Was this boy a natural human or had he devolved into an animal? Was he the product of nature or nurture? But if Itar and the public had been expecting a noble savage, they were sorely disappointed. Victor was no Tarzan. As Truffaut's film shows, the boy remained wild and uncontrollable. Most disappointing of all was that while he clearly understood some words, Victor never really developed human speech. How could society get the answers it wanted if the boy couldn't give them? Itard's frustration grew as the boy continuously failed to respond, and his critics became increasingly hostile. 
In the end, Itard gave up, and Victor spent the rest of his life in an institution. But it seems that Victor started a trend. The interest in the story somehow breeds more stories. By the early 20th century, cases of children allegedly raised by animals had appeared around the world. The most famous of these stories emerged from northern India. In 1920, a missionary traveling through the Bengal jungle was shocked to discover two infant girls living among a pack of wolves. Reverend Singh mounted a rescue mission to save the children, in the process killing their adopted wolf mother. He brought the girls back to the orphanage run by him and his wife in Midnapore, determined to give them a good Christian upbringing. The younger girl, Amala, didn't survive. And with the other, Kamala, progress was slow. Singh kept a journal which describes what you might expect from a child raised by wolves. She couldn't talk, walked on all fours, ate raw meat and scratched at the door to be let out. It took years, but eventually Reverend Singh and his wife claimed to have taught Kamala to behave as a human. The scientific community learned of Kamala's case in the late 1920s when the story hit the British news. Sadly, by that time, Kamala had died of cholera. For decades, scientists debated whether Singh's tales of the wolf girls were true. The one person who could have told them was Kamala herself. But, like Victor, she never learned to speak. This appears to be a common theme. Few, if any, children who grow up in the wild are reported to ever learn language. Scientists now believe that nearly all babies are born with the ability to learn to speak. But in order to master language, they have to hear it during their formative years. For Victor of Aberon and Kamala, the window of opportunity may have closed during their time in the wild, away from human contact. The same appears to have been true of John Sabunya in Uganda. Although the facts of his early childhood are unclear, it appears that the boy was deprived of human contact for a period of between six months and a year. When the young child was brought out of the jungle and into the Ugandan village as a frightened wild boy, he too had trouble making himself understood. When he was annoyed, he used to make a lot of noise, crowing like, crowing like, a, like an animal. Go, 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 go. His behaviors were different from, our, from ours. And then we wanted to know how, how is this boy communicating. He never knew how to speak, really. So did John ever learn to speak? And if so, what did he reveal about his time alone in the jungle? No one seemed to know exactly how long John Sabunya lived in the Ugandan wilderness before he was rescued. But what is clear is that during that time, and isolated from all human contact, apparently lost the ability to communicate with people. Shortly after John was rescued by the village woman, he was taken to an orphanage run by a Ugandan couple, Molly and Paul Waswa, who at any given time had up to 1,000 children in their care. But Molly admits that John was different from all the other children. She recalls the villagers first impressions of him. People were surrounding him, trying to, he, he looked like some people wanted to have a look at him and laughing at him and thinking that he's a monkey boy. They told him he's half human and he's half animal. At first, Molly found the idea of keeping John in her household shocking. I said, oh my God. I told my husband, why have you brought such a person? I mean, this, this, I said, this thing will snatch our baby and run away with it. But Molly's husband, Paul, saw something special in John. He was convincing everyone in the home that this boy will become somebody. It didn't take long for him to convince Molly. I came back to my senses. I said, I must look after him like my own. Molly tried to track down the boy's family. 
there were a number of stories circulating around the village about his parents. And eventually, Molly gathered enough information to piece together John's story. It all began in this house, now abandoned. The mother had died, so the stepmother used to mistreat him. And somebody also said that they, this uh, stepmother might have used some African charms to bewitch him and uh, he had to run, to run away from home. Just four years old, John left his house and ran into the darkness of the jungle. Molly believed that it was here, nestled among the trees, alone and helpless, that John came face to face with the vervet monkeys. But as frightening as that experience must have been for John, running away from home was the beginning of a new life. Twelve years later, John Sabunye is living happily with his new family. Now 17 years old, he still lives at the orphanage. In the years since he left the jungle, he's made tremendous progress. But to this day, he has trouble learning. John functions at a kindergarten level, and he speaks and understands only a little Ugandan and English. But in other ways, John has excelled. His love of running led Molly and Paul to enter him in the Special Olympics. And this has now become a passion. One of the key people in John's life is Solomon M. Weber, who acts as his big brother and mentor. Over the years, Solomon has learned to interpret John's broken language. John has become used to the urban world of Kampala. But we've asked Solomon to bring John back to the place where he was first found, to see if he remembers anything about his time in the wild. John's a bit nervous, but there's one thing he remembers clearly. Well, we're here with John, and uh, he's been trying to explain to me that this used to be his home. This is the very tree he was found, but it was a bit short when he could climb it. So this is the very tree where he was found. Solomon asks what else John remembers. John remembers more of the young monkeys, the small monkeys. He says that most of his time during the time, they were spending that time on eats. They were ever eating whatever they had. The reality of being lost in the jungle would surely have been frightening for a small boy. But that isn't what John seems to remember. Instead, he recalls playing with the monkeys. John says that uh, when he was with the small monkeys, they used to hide and each one had to go and look for another one. So they were playing. It was kind of their game. So that's the, the thing they used to, to do. Eating and playing are what we might expect of the memories of a four-year-old child. But are these memories real? And would monkeys that encountered a young child in the woods really take care of him? John isn't the only child allegedly raised by monkeys. In the early 1900s, a notorious story emerged from South Africa. The strange tale of Lucas, the baboon boy. Near the small town of Kunap, Police apprehended a wild boy they claimed to have found living among a troop of baboons. The officers said he behaved like a wild animal. He ran on all fours, he bit them, and he shrieked like a baboon. The boy was institutionalized and eventually put into the care of a local farmer, who employed him as a farmhand and named him Lucas. But the same officers then declared they discovered the origins of this strange boy. They claimed that Lucas had been stolen by baboons when he was just an infant from a village nearby. The case caused a sensation in the international media and scientists were skeptical but intrigued. Renowned anthropologist Dr. Raymond Dart even sent a colleague to Kunap to interview the then adult Lucas in an attempt to see if there was anything behind the claim that he was the real-life Tarzan of South Africa. 
The idea of baboons raising a human infant sounds pretty far-fetched to 21st century experts. Not least because we now know that baboons can be fearsome predators and their troops enforce a strict social order. But there are several modern-day incidents caught on tape that suggest other higher primates might at least protect a human child. In 1996, a three-year-old boy fell into the gorilla pen at the Brookfield Zoo in Chicago. Keepers tried to drive the gorillas back from the unconscious child. The crowd watched in horror as they saw Binti, the dominant female of the group, pick him up. But instead of harming him, Binti protected the boy, holding him in her arms until human help arrived. The images are compelling. But holding an unconscious child isn't the same as caring for another species. Dr. Stephen Sumi from the National Institute of Child and Human Development in Maryland studies the biobehavioral development of another primate species, the rhesus monkey. And he thinks the idea of cross-species nurturing is a theoretical possibility. We know that rhesus monkeys will form relationships with other animals, dogs, wild cats, horses, so it's possible, I would think, in theory, for these monkeys to form relationships with people uh, over the long term as well. Dr. Sumi has observed a distinct pattern of response from the monkeys when it comes to human contact. The monkeys that we study here uh, know all of the caretakers, they know the veterinarians, they know the individuals who collect data, they make decisions regarding the gender of the human they're interacting with, so they're more cautious around adult males than they are around adult females, and they make great differences in terms of the age of the humans that they're interacting with. And most interesting is the reaction of the monkeys to children. When my staff members bring their young children to watch the monkeys over the weekend, the monkeys go crazy, the adult males go through rituals as if to try to entice these little kids to join their group, whereas they wouldn't give adult humans any bit of their time or energy. But Ugandan expert Peter Appel is highly skeptical that any primate would nurture a human child in the wild. He thinks the zoo incident is an aberration. From what I know about animal behavior, that is a very unique case because their innate instinct would be to attack or kill this infant. Peter Appel is a veterinarian and Ugandan wildlife specialist. He works with a variety of primates, including vervet monkeys, the species that supposedly cared for John. And Appel has a slightly less romantic explanation as to how John survived with the monkeys. Vervets are by nature a trash species. They collect much more than they could eat. So probably what happened in this instance is that John survived on the leftover food that the vavets must have been collecting and couldn't finish. John would probably pick what was left over of that. This shifts the interpretation of the relationship between John and the monkeys. It was perhaps not the vervets that cared for John, but John who used them to survive. And, as Peter explains, there's a clear difference between tolerance and caretaking. To be nurtured means that you will be fully accepted into the structure of the society. John being human, it's very unlikely that he was nurtured. He could have been accepted or even just tolerated. Nurturing is not possible. But what led the four-year-old boy to the monkeys in the first place? Was it human survival instincts, a need for food, or was he in search of physical contact? Part of the allure of the wild child myth is the bond that occurs between human and animal. This is what makes these stories so compelling. But would a child deprived of human contact actually substitute an animal for a parent? Several recent cases seem to suggest they would. In the early 1990s, a story emerged from the Ukraine of a young girl living on a rundown farm. Her name was Oksana Malaya, and she was apparently raised by dogs. According to this Russian television report, Oksana was just three years old when her alcoholic parents first left her outside with the dogs. For five years, she slept in a kennel and lived as a dog, running on all fours, barking and eating with her canine companions. 
To observers, it seemed as though the young girl had turned to the dogs for affection when her abusive parents failed her. And Dr. Charles Nelson III, a professor of pediatrics at Harvard Medical School, believes they could be right. It may be that we humans are genetically programmed to seek affection, or at the very least, a stable relationship with another living thing. The question of whether we're hardwired to seek affection is a very interesting one, and the answer seems to be yes. In the case of Oksana, if this little girl was just left with dogs, she's going to form a relationship with those dogs. If we have this biological imperative to form a relationship, if your only option is a dog, you'll form a relationship with the dog. This biological imperative may well be a human survival mechanism. Although we're totally dependent at birth, we're genetically programmed to ask for help, because engaging a caregiver means we're likely to get the things we need to survive, like food and warmth. So it's possible that in the absence of a parent, a feral child might interact with an animal in the same way. John Sabunia sought the company of monkeys, and in return got enough food to survive. And Oksana Malaya looked to a pack of dogs for comfort, and they provided warmth. Oksana was finally rescued at the age of 13 and placed in a foster home. But what effect does this kind of extreme experience have on a child? Modern science has discovered that a young child's brain is highly impressionable. The developing brain cells are primed and ready to be sculpted into crucial neurological centers. One bundle of cells will become the language center, while others will govern the senses, emotions, and personality. The sculptor is the youngster's environment, everything they see, hear, and experience. When you see a parent interacting with a child, not only are you seeing a happy baby, but you're seeing this sculpting process at work, hardwiring healthy neurons to build a biologically balanced brain. One of the things we know about brain development is that the brain depends critically on experiences. For it to grow and develop normally, it assumes that the environment is going to support it, presenting all kinds of experiences to the child. If those experiences are absent or abnormal, then you assume that the wiring of the brain has become abnormal or miswired. From the age of three, Oksana was exposed to predominantly canine experiences. And as a result, she learned to act and respond like a dog. And John Sabunia apparently lost the critical learning and speech ability during his time in the jungle. That sensitive period, those first three to five years, are really an essential point in development for the brain to get wired correctly. If the brain has been miswired early on, it's like having a bad foundation to a house. Clearly, these experiences had devastating effects on the children and on their development. But despite the appalling treatment she received from her parents, Oksana appears to have adjusted to her new environment. This 2001 interview on Russian television demonstrates that she's learned to speak. What makes you most happy? I like to run around like a dog, to bark and howl. Why? It is my nature. Scientists now understand that a child's brain has a remarkable ability to adapt and even rewire, depending on the length and severity of the experience and the age at which it took place. So what about John? As part of his work on feral children, Dr. Douglas Candland has followed John Sabunya's progress for years. He's now returned to Uganda to re-interview John as a 17-year-old, to see what, if anything, Hello. he can remember about his time with the vervet oh, monkeys. Good to see you. Good to see you. It has been a long time. Candland first met John about six years ago, when he was still a young boy and had difficulty communicating. He's delighted to see that John has lost his inhibitions and even become an entertainer. But as a scientist, Dr. Candlin still has questions about John's story. People's first question is, is this a true story? Nobody has exactly the same story, but everybody has the same thing. The recurring theme, based on the memories of a four-year-old, is that John ran away from home and was adopted by the monkeys. 
Candlin wants to examine John's story from the perspective of an animal behaviorist to ascertain exactly how John interacted with the vervets. He's asked John, with Solomon at his side, to piece together what he remembers. When you lived in the forest, you said there were many animals there. Were there large animals as well as small animals? He said that there were big monkeys and small monkeys. There were also snakes and uh, antelope and some other animals. Can you show me the monkeys that you saw there? And then the great one. Well, he says that the first two. He saw them. John has no trouble identifying the vervets, but Calvin wants to establish how John fitted into the complex hierarchy of the vervet community. Mm -hmm. Vervet monkeys will spend the afternoon grooming each other. It's about establishing a relationship. It's kind of like talking uh, among human beings. Did you groom monkeys? Mm -hmm. Well, the monkeys groomed each other, but not John. This suggests that John was a bystander, not a part of the monkey group. Next, Cantlin tests the theory that John wasn't fed by the monkeys, but rather scavenged for their leftovers. Do you mean they threw food and you collected it? But according to Solomon, John is emphatic about this. They collected food and brought food to him. Sometimes you could, they could hand the food into his hand, but none of the monkeys got the food and threw the food away. John and Solomon also tell Dr. Cantlin that the monkeys brought water to him. But this is how they made the thing, and they handed the water to him. But it was the monkeys who made, yeah. who made this, yeah. not John. Not John. The monkeys. Dr. Cantlin, a 40-year veteran of working with primates, is not convinced. Few primates are capable of tool use, and vervets are not among them. Well, I think we are dealing here with some childhood memories that, like all childhood memories, become elaborated over time. I think he did spend much time with monkey troops. I think he did find food that they had cast aside. He may well have found banana leaves that were still had water in them from rainstorms and assumed that the animals themselves had done the fashioning. So when you ask, was John raised by monkeys, I prefer to say he was raised to some degree with monkeys, but I don't believe the monkeys uh, reared him in the usual sense of that word. In many ways, John seems to have survived his early experience of being lost in the jungle. But has he overcome the potentially more devastating tragedy, the abuse he suffered during the early years of his life, at the hands of people who were supposed to protect him? John Sabunye has obviously come a long way since his days in the jungle. The nurturing home of Molly and Paul Waswa has given him a second chance. But he still has difficulties with learning, coordination and language. Is this because he was alone in the jungle during the crucial development stage, when most children learn to speak? Or has something else affected John's recovery? With Molly's permission, we take John to get a complete brain scan in Uganda. At the International Medical Group in Kampala, a slightly nervous John undergoes a computed tomography scan that will produce images of the anatomy of his brain. Do you see that thing? The scan could identify any anomalies or possible damage done to the brain and help pinpoint the cause of John's continued learning difficulties. Dr. Jay Geed, a neuroscientist from the National Institute of Health in Maryland, will help to analyze the results. Dr. Geed is one of the world's preeminent specialists in brain development research. And the results reveal something unexpected. In almost every way, John's brain is healthy and normal except for one thing. The most striking feature is this dark area right here. This is a pretty big area of damage, about the size of a grapefruit. At some stage in his young life, John suffered a massive blow to the head. A pretty uh, major trauma to the brain. And the location of the trauma has important implications. This part of the brain is ground zero for language function. Understanding language, learning language, is almost completely wiped out here. 
just looking at the picture, not even knowing anything about John, I'd say, ah, this is a person who's probably going to have a lot of difficulty with language. But the good news is much of the rest of the brain is, uh, is fine. And so this should allow uh, John to enjoy life and to have an imagination and to have social interactions. The critical question is when did this injury occur? If the damage to the brain happens very early in brain development, then there's still a chance for the brain to find alternate routes, alternate connections, al alternate wiring. But if the damage happens after that's already in place, then it's much more difficult to recover function. And in looking at John's uh, brain scans, it looks to be that the second one happened, that the wiring was already established for the language centers and then was damaged. We may never know exactly when John received his injury, but we do know that it was the trauma to John's head in early life, not the effects of living in the wild, that caused the language difficulties John has today. What Sabunia's case demonstrates is that the effects of living in the wild reveal only half the story. The other half is how these children ended up there in the first place. Collectively, when I think of these feral children, it just brings to mind abuse and neglect. These children wind up living in the wild because they fled a bad situation. And that makes it more difficult to understand how that living in the wild will affect their brain development or the behavioral development because they let off life with a pretty bad beginning. This was clearly the case for Oksana, neglected by her alcoholic dysfunctional parents. And while we don't know exactly what happened in John's house in Uganda, there's a very real possibility that he was physically abused and driven out of his home. On closer examination, many famous wild child cases come down to parents who have abandoned their unwanted offspring. This may even have been what happened to Victor of Aveyron. In Dr. Ital's notes, he mentions a straight-edged scar on the boy's throat. Perhaps someone took the young child out into the woods and tried to end his life. Historically, it was not uncommon for parents to abandon children born with mental or physical disabilities. This is most certainly the explanation behind one famous case, that of Lucas, the boy allegedly raised by baboons. On closer inspection, scientists discovered that the boy was severely handicapped and had been abandoned by his family at birth. He spent his early years in various institutions before running away at about 13 years old. The baboon story was clearly a fabrication that had been imposed on the reality of a child with severe uh, disabilities or abnormalities. And once the rumor had been started, several people reaped the benefits. For years, the farmer George Smith and the officers that originally found Lucas perpetuated the myth and cashed in on the sensational story. There's a similar explanation behind the other famous case of the time, that of Amala and Kamala in India. The reported story told how Reverend Singh had found the girls living with wolves in the jungle of Bengal. But later interviews with local villagers revealed a very different story. It turned out that he came through with a hunting party every year at the same time, told the villagers he was looking for orphans to take to his orphanage. It doesn't take too much imagination to imagine some parents saying, we have two badly retarded daughters who are going to be a huge drain on our limited resources. And this man is offering to take them to an orphanage. So what might happen is that they were left in a place where the fellow huntsman knew to find them, and everybody's happy. So why did Reverend Singh write a long and dramatic account of fighting the wolves for the children? Adriana Benzaken thinks that his motives were probably simple. He had a group of children that he was responsible for, and the orphanage was always short of cash, yeah? And perhaps by saying that the two of his children were wolf children and bringing attention and money into the orphanage might have been a motive. 
the real stories behind the cases of feral children seem never to be simple. Some are pure hoaxes, such as the kangaroo girl story created as a publicity stunt, and others are tragic cases of abused or disabled children turned into sensational stories by the media, or misused by an overzealous scientific community looking for answers. Claiming that a child is a wild child is never innocent. Usually there is an investment in that, there is an interest. Either you want to study that child, or you want to exploit that child to somehow bring attention to your cause. But there's always a motive behind it. With Oksana, Victor and John Sabunya, the important stories may be those of the abuse and neglect they suffered at the hands of their human caretakers. And perhaps the myth of the wild child reflects our inability to accept the failings of our so-called civilized society. John Sabunya's childhood was undeniably tragic, but happily his future looks promising. He continues to compete in the Special Olympics, and he performs with the Pearl of Africa Children's Choir. To much of the world he will always be known as Uganda's famous wild child. But the real story here is that of a young man's resilience and grace against incredible odds.